So now we come to the third and final film of the of the Black Lagoon trilogy with The Creature Walks Among Us, which came out in 1956 and was essentially the last official Universal Monster film. <clears throat> there was Abbott and Costello films, I believe, in 55 and 58. I think there was one in 58. Or if not, then this really was the last, the last of the Universal Monster films. And then a year later, Hammer started doing theirs. So this was 1956, and it was the only one not to be directed by Jack Arnold. He directed the first two. Um, I guess he had moved on to A-list films, and at that time there really were no A-list horror films. He even said he had no more to contribute to the horror genre, so he went on to quote real pictures. So it was actually uh, directed by um, John Sherwood, who He was the uh, Universal International Assistant Director, I'm guessing, of the whole company. And again, it doesn't star anyone from the previous film except for uh, Riku Browning as the underwater um, gill man. Don McGowan played the on land gill man. And other people, we had Jeff Morrow, Rex Reeson, Lee Snowden, which some of these names do sound familiar. Lee Snowden is the blonde female. Um, she only acted in the 50s, 55, 61, then a lot of television. Um, Jeff Morrow... Moro, rather. Um, don't recognize anything from him either. <clears throat> but, uh, so this story has. So the Gill Man has escaped from. <coughs> excuse me. The Oceanarium in Florida and he's made his way into the ocean well actually um, he made his way into the Everglades and then um, this team of scientists head by Dr. Barton played by Morrow he's mentally unstable and Abusive to his wife, who is Lee Snowden. Especially when she's around other men, like the guys on the ship. But they... They eventually make their way out to the ocean. I, I watched this at like 4 in the morning this morning, so... I'm probably going to be missing a lot of steps, but basically... At one point, they're, they're looking for the Gill Man. And where this one's in the ocean, you get a much bigger underwater sequences that really do, once again, look great. You know, it, it feels like a much bigger scope. They go way deeper. <clears throat> you really get to see how long Riku Browning can hold his breath. But at one point, the Gill Man gets set on fire and they bring him aboard the ship they treat him and it burnt the outer scales off his whole body the thorns or his nails his claws and essentially his gills and he now has lungs don't know how it happened but it happened so pretty much take I already put the case back in the box set so I have nothing to hold up so pretty much just take the Gilman and just smooth them out. 
And that's what he looks like. And, um... Well, actually, I guess after he was burnt, <clears throat> um, Barton himself and his colleagues sort of transformed him. Or, okay, it was a mixture of surgery to save him and his natural, his body's natural response of shedding and losing the scales and the gills and adapting some sort of lung. <clears throat> so they put clothes on him and he looked much bigger than before. He, like he's much stockier, more broad. They, they throw scrubs on him. He goes back into the ocean and he tries to swim down, but he he doesn't know the difference and he starts to lose his breath and they got to go down and get him. His eyes now look like the actor's eyes, human eyes. They're not like the big, you know, fish eyes that he had before. And <clears throat> they, it, essentially, it leads up to them trying to get the creature to live amongst humans. They feel like he's adapting or learning. So, um... They're, they, they take him to this one place, essentially a farm. Yeah, he goes from the water to a farm with, like, goats and shit. And he keeps looking off in the water. You can tell he's sad. He doesn't like it. Um, the doctor kills a guy that, uh, was getting involved with his wife. And he try, tries to put the blame on the gill man. And he realizes what's going on like he realized hey he killed this guy i'm getting blamed for it fuck this and he just goes on a rampage which there is another part where there's this guard who like a guard on the ship who has a thing for um lee snowden's character and <clears throat> he attempts to rape her or at the very least assault her in some way and this is when the the gill man first awakens after being burnt and it was kind of funny because it wasn't quite beauty and the beast this one isn't quite beauty and the beast as the first two especially the second one but like he walks into this room where she's being attacked by this guy and he's just kind of walking like this he like attacks the guy looks at the girl and then just kind of walks off and just kind of like, walks up to the railing of the boat, just kind of flips over. And after he goes on a rampage, <clears throat> he rips down the electric fence and the place that he's confined in, kills the, the doctor, walks back to the sea, and he's last seen on the beach walking towards the ocean. So I get it's left kind of ambiguous. Like, is he going to adapt the way he is? Is he going to drown himself? It's left pretty ambiguous. But like the first two, this one is pretty straightforward. I mean, group of scientists, they're... The first movie, they weren't looking necessarily for the Gill Man. They just find him. Then the second and third one, they are looking for him. And then it's just what they do with him. That's the rest of the film. Like the last one was they want to uh, study him in this aquarium, this oceanarium. Here, he gets badly burnt. <clears throat> and realizing that he can now breathe air with his new lungs, they want to see if they can get him to learn and adapt to sort of live with humans. And that's pretty much the film. 
very simple, very straightforward. I applaud it for that. I was actually surprised by this whole trilogy because I thought the this was the only series of the monster films that I had not seen a single film except for the second one which I saw on Mystery Science Theater 3000. But usually when I tend to watch that, I'm usually listening to the riffs more than I am the actual movie. <clears throat> so I'd seen that, but not really, really seen it. And I was kind of thinking it's a little more science fiction-y and I, 50s, bit more B-movie. Didn't really think I was going to like it. But I was actually surprised. I mean, yeah, they are B-movies. They are kind of cheesy. The first one's a classic. The second one is... And they're all different from each other. That's another big thing. They came out each subsequent year from 54 to 56. Each one is different. They all do different things. <clears throat> each one is bigger than the last one. You know, I really like the underwater sequences in this because it's in the ocean. So, I mean, it's way deeper, way farther away. It's not as confined like in the Black Lagoon. Um, I would say the acting from the main cast in all these films were at the very least serviceable. Not like I think I forgot to mention in Revenge of the Creature, there's this couple who's parking. And this cop tells him to move along because the gill man's been sighted. And the guy's just like, all right, all right, officer. You got it. Whatever you say. Like, really cheesy acting. But there's really not too, too much to say about these movies. Because they are so straightforward. Um, this one was not released in uh, 3D. It was not shot in 3D. Um... It was shot in Florida. I don't think this one was quite as well received. Yeah, it doesn't really give any kind of reviews. But, you know, I, I could say that these films were enjoyable for what they were. I mean, we got to see a different original kind of monster. Each movie did something different. <clears throat> Um, it was interesting to see him go from this prehistoric, scaly gill man to this, you know, sort of smoothed and out, smooth, let me try that again, smoothened out, kind of lung air breathing, wearing clothes, kind of still prehistoric, but, you know, adapting a little bit. It was good that they stopped here. You know, they kind of quit while they were ahead. Also, I think just them ending the monster cycle had a, something to do with it as well. But, uh, music was composed by Henry Mancini, which sounds familiar. Uh, he's known for the Pink Panther theme, Peter Gunn theme. Love theme from Romeo and Juliet. Moon River from Breakfast at Tiffany's. Um, okay, so he's done a lot of stuff that I've heard of. Um, okay, wow. So yeah, he's done some stuff I'm, I'm familiar with, but <clears throat> uh, for the most part, these are just kind of more so than the other monster films, just good sort of popcorn, cheesy fun, not quite the groundbreaking classics like say Dracula or the first two Frankensteins, but still good. I mean, I, uh, I had fun with them. But anyway, so that was Creature from the Black Lagoon series. I still have The Invisible Man, <clears throat> the Abbott Costello films, and Spanish Dracula to get to at some point. But <laughs> I still got a lot of shit to watch. Anyway, 
Thank you for watching.